Proof and Eminem grew up together on the same block in Detroit. In fact, it was actually Proof that encouraged Eminem back in the early days to get down the hip hop shop and hone his freestyling skills at the open mic. In fact, even if you're just a casual Eminem fan who doesn't really know his best buddy Proof, you might remember the character Future from the film 8 Mile, played by Mackay Pfeiffer, who is actually based on Proof. Throughout his career, Proof remained a generally underground and low-key kind of guy. But Proof did have a kind of unfortunate brush with fame many years before he became a household name. Alongside Bizarre, he appeared in a music video that was shot in Detroit for the unfortunately titled song by Aaliyah, Age Ain't Nothing But A Number. I hope R. Kelly can take some comfort in those lyrics when he's finally released from jail at age 90. Anyway, aside from that unfortunate cameo, Proof had big plans of making it big in the rap game. And it was around 1996 that he decided to get his Wu-Tang Clan on and assemble his own crew of rappers from Detroit. The plan was to find 12 of the best MCs in the D and form a crew called the Dirty Dozen, or D12. But the problem was, finding 12 sick MCs was a lot harder than RZA made it look. So as things went on, somebody had the genius idea of just finding 6 sick MCs and giving them all an alter ego split personality. Altogether, making up the Dirty Dozen with 6 rappers and 6 alter egos. In fact, this is actually where Eminem's Slim Shady alter ego came from, and every member of the group had their own split personality. Now, this was a really dope concept, but Unfortunately, over the years, it did lead to quite a lot of confusion amongst casual fans who didn't really know who they were listening to and were struggling to remember the two names for every rapper in the crew. So let me help you out with that. You got Proof, AKA Dirty Harry. Obviously Eminem, AKA Slim Shady. You got Bizarre, AKA Peter S. Bizarre. Conniver, AKA Rondell Bean. Swift, AKA Swifty McVeigh. And Mr. Porter, AKA Con Artist. I thought Ja Rule was the con artist. D12 made their debut in 1997, dropping the Underground EP. And it was around this time that several members of the group started popping off in different ways. Bizarre was named Inner City Entertainment's Flavor of the Week. Proof won a freestyling competition that was run by The Source magazine. And Eminem had just dropped his Slim Shady LP, which would eventually end up in the hands of Dr. Dre and lead to his Slim Shady LP and him absolutely blowing up. However, just as Eminem's star was rising, tragedy was about to hit the group. In the early days before D12 as you know them today, there was another member of the group who was named Bugs. He'd actually been introduced to the group by his friend Swift. But unfortunately, on May the 21st, 1999, there was an altercation in Detroit, which left Bugs shot four time and struck by a car, leaving him dead. After the death of Bugs, the crew were left shaken and the mood of things became really dark. At the time, Eminem wasn't a permanent member of the group and after Bugs passed, he decided to make a temporary return to help the crew fulfill some of the short-term obligations they had coming up, but ultimately this led to him rejoining permanently. And interestingly, the group were known to have had a pact between them that if one of them blew up, they would come back and get the rest of them and put them on. Once the Slim Shady LP went triple platinum, it was pretty clear that Eminem was here to stay. And Eminem made sure to keep his promise to come back for the crew. And this was actually the main reason that he established his Shady Records imprint in order to get a deal under Interscope and sign D12. In fact, once Eminem blew up in 2000, Proof joined Eminem as his hype man on the Up and Smoke Tour, aka the Weed Smoking Olympics, alongside Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. The crew continued to honor their fallen friends and both the albums, the Marshall Mathers LP and D12's Devil's Night were both dedicated to the memory of Bugs. And also you might remember that an old recording of the song Desperados by Bugs was included on the later D12 album, D12 World, under the title Bugs 97. <laughs> The release of the D12 album Devil's Night saw the United crew, under Proof's leadership, hit the top of the charts. That album was actually named after the Detroit tradition of setting abandoned buildings and bandos on fire the night before Halloween, as depicted in the film 8 Mile. I assume they did this by breaking in and playing a copy of my recent album. Following the successful chart-topping release of Devil's Night, the crew took a three-year break from music to enjoy life and lean into some solo projects. Proof even had a cameo in 8 Mile playing the rapper Lil Tick, who actually battles Eminem at the start when he chokes. Though to be fair, I'd always rather see Eminem choking on a mic than a mouthful of Ambient. But by 2004, the gang had returned to the studio and recorded their follow-up album, D12 World. This was another great success and ended up topping the Billboard charts once again. But America wasn't enough for this crew and D12 were going global, and this album actually also topped the charts in several other English-speaking countries, including Australia, Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, and the UK. And after D12 World dropped, Proof continued having solo success all on his own by independently releasing his own album, Searching for Jerry Garcia, on his newly established Iron Fist Records. But then, in a really unfortunate case of foreshadowing, Proof was depicted in Eminem's video, Like Toy Soldiers, being shot and killed, in a scene that was meant to see Proof actually playing the role of Bugs in his previous murder. Eminem later claimed to have felt guilt for depicting Proof's death in his video, and he wondered whether or not this was bad karma. Shouldn't be so hard on himself. But right up until Proof's death, 
Proof and Eminem were as tight as ever, with Proof even stepping up to be Eminem's best man at his ill-fated second marriage to his wife Kim that only lasted 82 days. Now there's a lot of conflicting info out there on what actually happened on the day that Proof died, and a lot of questions still go unanswered to this day. In the early hours of April the 11th, 2006, Proof was playing pool in the Triple C Club in Detroit after a night of bar hopping, and apparently an argument broke out over a game of pool. Apparently tensions rose in an argument between Proof and a war veteran named Keith Bender Jr., and this escalated into a fist fight. Now at some point, Proof got his hands on a gun and shot Bender in the face. Interestingly, this didn't actually kill Keith Bender immediately, and he would end up dying eight days later in hospital. But apparently after that shot was fired, the club bouncer and cousin of Keith Bender, Mario Etheridge, shot Proof twice in the chest and once in the head, leaving him dead at the scene. And seemingly one of the most upsetting details about this story is apparently after Proof was killed, his body was taken out the back of his club and his money and jewelry was stolen from him before the police arrived. Etheridge drove Bender to the hospital and called the police en route to tell them about the shooting. But Proof's killer would evade police for the next few days before turning himself in with a lawyer. Now the version of events that were initially reported in the media were that Proof started shooting first, killing Bender, and Etheridge shot him back, killing Proof in self-defense, which is legal under Detroit law. However, some reports did come out later that actually suggested that Etheridge may have fired a warning shot in the air first whilst the fistfight was going on. Apparently, according to this version of events, this created an enormous panic in the bar, leading to Proof returning fire with the fatal shot that would hit Bender in the face and kill him, before he was then killed by the three shots that came from Etheridge. And it's important to remember that Proof's lawyer argued that there was no evidence that Proof had fired the first shot, and it was actually later stated by police that Proof did not have a gun when he arrived at the bar. Furthermore, the initial reports of this private fist fight between these people that were involved might have been wildly inaccurate. In fact, some witnesses have said that before Etheridge fired that warning shot, it was much more of a mass brawl involving a lot of people in that bar. It was eventually found that Etheridge was acting lawfully in self-defense by killing Proof, but he was later found guilty of carrying and discharging an illegal firearm. He ended up only getting time served from when he initially turned himself in and a $2,000 fine. And a few months following the shooting, a close friend of Proof's who was there gave a double XL interview disputing the public version of events. He suggested that Proof got his hands on a gun just after Etheridge fired that first warning shot, which apparently Bender grabbed hold of during the scuffle, and it was Etheridge that fired four shots, killing both men. This is a compelling narrative, but it's honestly hard not to consider any of these narratives potentially biased. And essentially, those are the facts that are out there, but we might never know the real truth of what happened there on that day. Proof was given a very honourable send-off, being buried in a 24-carat gold casket at the Fellowship Chapel in Detroit on April the 19th to a full house of over 2,600 people. I hope Proof would have been up there smiling, thinking that he was still selling out huge venues after his death. Eminem was sat beside Paul Rosenberg and 50 Cent at the funeral and gave a very powerful and moving eulogy. Now, there's actually an amateur recording of Eminem's speech from the funeral floating around on the internet, but I personally felt it might have been a little bit disrespectful because it seems like it's something that was recorded without permission. But you can find that if you want to go out there and find it. But here's some of what he said. He came to me one day when I was living in my house on the east side and threw a pair of shoes at me. He said, put them on. I said, why? He said, put them on your feet. I said, why? because I'm tired of you wearing them dirty ass shoes. He illuminated a room when he walked in. Without proof, there would be a Marshall Mathers, but there would not be an Eminem, there would not be a D12, and there would not be a Slim Shady. Swift from D12 actually ended up in jail after the funeral because he actually missed a court date to be a pallbearer. This landed him 93 days in jail, which was probably worth it. I can't imagine how hard Eminem must have been suffering at this point, considering that Proof's passing was only a few months after his first stint in rehab for an addiction to the sleeping pill Ambien. And anyone that's followed Eminem's career even casually knew that over the next few years would be a real tough battle for him with addiction. But the crew continued to keep Proof's legacy alive. The Shady Records compilation album The Re-Up released featuring a track from Proof called Track. Eminem went on to dedicate several songs to Proof over the years, including Difficult and You're Never Over. However, Eminem would surprise the world many years later when he dropped his album Kamikaze, which featured the song Stepping Stones, where he announced the end of the group D12. In fact, actually saying that the moment the Proof died, so did the group. So that's the story of how Proof of D12 died. Proof has been sorely missed by the hip hop community for over a decade now, but his legacy lives on and he'll never be forgotten. He's always gonna go down as history as one of the most significant people in the hip hop scene. Even though he kept it low key and he wasn't necessarily known to the widest commercial audience, anybody that's into hip hop knows 
that Proof was pretty much single-handedly responsible for forming one of the most significant hip-hop groups in history and nurturing the talent of essentially one of the best rappers in the world. Rest in peace, Proof, and thank you for all of the great music that you brought us over the years. Hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, make sure that you like and subscribe, and please go and check out my other recent video on how Snoop Dogg beat his murder case. That one's really interesting, and it definitely deserves a watch if you haven't seen it. Thanks very much. Peace out.